Hello students, welcome to the lecture. In the last lecture, I have discussed about applications of UV visible spectroscopy. I will continue with that and then I will also go to fluorescence spectroscopy. In this lecture, I will discuss about what is the principle of fluorescence spectroscopy. So, in the last lecture, I started discussing about how to get dissociation constants of acids and bases. So, as you remember that uh, the equation of Henderson Hasselbeck which is pH is equal to pKa plus log A minus by HA. So, this is basically solved by acid ratio. So, if somehow we can determine the salt and acid ratio at a particular given pH, I can know what is the pKa value at that pH and that is what we try to do using UV visible spectroscopy, UV visible spectroscopy and then we determine the salt acid ratio to get pKa value. So, here is one example where your one dye is given whose HA form is this and A minus form is this. Now, what you do is you take the acid at different pH conditions. So, from 1 pH to pH 6.1 and since this is an equilibria, so it changes from one form to another, one form to another. So, your acidic form will be at pH 1 or salt form A minus form will be at pH 6.1, 6.1. Now, as pH increases, you can see this peak is going down and this peak is going up. So, peak at 457 going down and peak at 566 going up. So, what does that mean is? 457 nanometer corresponds to HA peak, whereas 566 nanometer correspond to A minus peak, A minus peak. And just by measuring the absorbance at 457 nanometer and 566 nanometer, I can get the ratio between A minus to HA. So, A minus A minus concentration by HA is equal to absorbance at absorbance at 566 nanometer divided by absorbance at 457 nanometer, 457 nanometer. So, just by doing that, we can calculate the ratio between your salt and acid, ratio between salt and acid and based on that, we can calculate what is the pKa value at particular pH, pKa value at particular pH. For example, we can calculate, we can calculate the pKa value for methyl red, methyl red at some given pH. So, methyl red has this structure which is basically your acidic form and you can say as HMR, give this a name of HMR and this is your MR minus where your 1 H plus which is here as are dissociated, dissociated. So, this is MR minus form, this happens at PS6. So, suppose I want to calculate uh, the ratio of MR minus and HMR between 4 and 6, what we can do is you need to measure absorbance at 430 nanometer and 520 nanometer. So, MR minus absorbs at 430 nanometer and HMR absorbs at 520 nanometer. So, just by taking the ratio of this, 
we can get the ratio of salt and acid and that can help you in the determination of K value at a particular pH at a particular pH. So, this is your absorbance of the two species as a function of wavelength. So, this is your peak for HMR and this is peak for your MR. And if I plot the absorbance, how absorbance at 520 nanometer decreases with increase in pH, this is your the plot. And as this start decreasing, this starts increasing, which is a peak due to MR. So, this is the peak due to MR and this is the peak due to HMR. So, at 4, HMR is present and at 6, MR is present. In between, we can get the acid salt ratio and by measuring acid salt ratio or by calculating acid salt ratio, I can know pK value at the particular pH. UV visible spectroscopy can also be used to know the chemical kinetic parameters. Kinetics of any reaction can be studied using UV visible spectroscopy. The UV radiation passes through reaction cell and absorbance can be observed as a function of time. For example, this is the, the reduction of nitro functional group of para nitrophenol to para amino phenol. So, this is para nitrophenol PNP and this is your P, uh, this is your para amino phenol, para amino phenol. So, this is PAP, this is PAP. So, PNP to PAP. So, now you can see that PNP decreases with increase in time where as PAP increases with time it means PNP is getting converted into PAP and you can look at minus D PNP by DT or you can also look at D PAP by DT to know the rate of reaction to know the rate of reaction and kinetics is quite often used to know the mechanism of the reaction and so measuring the rate of reaction is quite important when we are dealing with the mechanism of the reaction and UV visible spectroscopy can be used to know the kinetics or can be used to observe the kinetics of a reaction. Here I am not going to discuss in detail how to get the kinetic parameters using UV visible spectroscopy, but I am going to discuss once I complete the fluorescence spectroscopy. What I will do is I will go and show you how can, uh, your UV visible spectroscopy or fluorescence can be used to determine different kinetic parameters. In fact, I will also go and show you how to obtain different binding parameter using a spectroscopic signal, for example, absorbance of fluorescence intensity. You can calculate the delta G of a reaction, your, uh, the equilibrium constant, you can uh, calculate delta H, you can calculate delta S and you can also know whether a reaction is a first order, is a reaction is a second order. And once you know that, you can also propose a mechanism, uh, you can also calculate the activation parameter. This all can be done using a spectroscopic signal. Here in UV visible spectroscopy, a spectroscopic signal is absorbance, whereas in fluorescence intensity, a spectroscopic signal can be fluorescence intensity. So, here is one of the example where UV visible spectroscopy can be used to study the chemical reaction. In this reaction, nitroethane is converted into nitroethane anion which absorbs at 240 nanometer and you can look at the absorbance at 240 nanometer with respect to time to uh, look at the progress of the reaction. And from this, we can always calculate D 
your nitroethane by D T, D nitroethane by D T, uh, ethane anion, this is nitroethane anion by D T, okay. so, uh, sorry this should be plus since product is increasing. Uh, so, here in this case what we looked at is the kinetics of product formation, we can also look at the kinetics of reactant used. Okay, reactant used, uh, how a reactant is utilized in a particular reaction. For example, in this case, uh, pyruvate plus NADH uh, gives you lactate in presence of lactate dehydrogenase. You can look at the absorbance at 340 nanometer, which is due to NADH, which is a reactant. And as expected, the absorbance will decrease with time, but here the absorbance signal of reactant can be used to look at the kinetics of the reaction, kinetics of the reaction. So, UV visible can also be used to discuss here in diaggregation, different kind of aggregation. The different kind of aggregate has different spectral shift. For example, there are two different kind of aggregates in cyanine di. One is H type aggregate where molecules arrange face to face in a near vertical stack. So, absorbed absorption band shift to shorter wavelength, then the monomer absorption band, and this is your typical diagram, and this is your H aggregate. J type aggregate, the molecules arrange in slanted stack, it has a slanted arrangement and that arrangement is called J aggregate and the difference between these two can be done using UV visible spectroscopy because here absorbance maxima shift to longer wavelength with narrow band, with the narrow band. So, H aggregates has shorter wavelength than the monomer whereas J aggregate has longer wavelength than monomer. And here is your the spectra, this is for monomer, so this is blue is absorption, this red one is fluorescence emission. So, absorption band if you look it is here and if you see at this position it is going to shorter wavelength and if you look at this is the absorbance and this goes to higher wavelength in case of J aggregates. This J aggregates and H aggregates are quite useful in optical switches, they are used in artificial light harvesting system, they are used in photoreducers, they are used in chemical and biological sensing, they has applications in biological and medical imaging, they have application in photography and they can be used as photovoltaic sensitizer, photovoltaic sensitizer. So, these aggregates have several different applications and UV visible spectroscopy can be used to know whether a particular aggregate form is of S type or J type. Not only that, uh, UV visible spectroscopy is quite often used in biochemistry for quantifying and to study thermal denaturation. So, this is for DNA molecule and you see, see this is double stranded DNA going to single strand DNA with the temperature and the denaturation temperature can be calculated by looking at absorbance at 260 nanometer. I have already told that 260 nanometer corresponds to your DNA lambda max and you can see that at higher temperature absorbance increases when uh, double standard DNA goes to single standard DNA and just by looking at the A260 maximum by 2, you can know what is the Tm value, what is the Tm value. This is the typical diagram of double standard DNA, this is typical diagram of denatured DNA, although lambda max does not change, but there is change in absorbance. So, double standard DNA as lower absorbance compared to the denatured DNA. Again, you see the AT base pair and GC base pair 
is going to have a different kind of TM and if you look at this the, that can also be looked through the absorbance at 260 nanometer and now you can see this is the TM for poly AT and this is the TM for poly GC and you can see that poly GC is more stable compared to poly AT. Poly AT it is around 70, 70 degree Celsius for poly GC it is around 110 degree Celsius and heat denaturation can be thought of like this from double standard to single standard. Now absorbance is not only dependent on a particular functional group, it is only partly determined by its chemical structure. The environment of chromophore also affect precise spectrum obtained. For example, pH can affect the, the spectrum, the solvent polarity can affect the spectrum and orientation effect can affect the system. For example, I showed you one case that here your single standard DNA and double standard DNA has different spectral profile, different spectral profile that is because of change in the environment and that can be used to look at the environment associated with particular chromophore. For example, changes in spectra of a protein in different solvent can give information about the local environment of the protein. You see here this is absorbance versus wavelength, same protein, same concentration. If you look at the spectral profile in presence of two different solvent, the spectral profile is quite different. This is in the presence of DMSO, this is in presence of glycerol and just by looking at the spectra, you can tell about what is the changes going on around the chromophore in that particular solvent. The unfolding refolding kinetics in the presence of denaturants can also be determined from the spectral changes between native and denatured protein. For example, this is a native protein, the spectra is quite different than spectra of that protein in urea, that protein in urea. And so the spectra can tell you about the different conformations of the protein present. Other application is just like uh, DNA, we can also monitor the thermal stability of protein by monitoring the absorption at various temperature. Absorption at 292 nanometer with temperature can give you the information about the TM value and you can look at that room temperature and a high temperature spectra of a given protein is quite different. We can also look at a stability in different buffers by measuring unfolding with the temperature. So this is the curve obtained for, this is the this is the stability curve which is basically absorbance versus temperature curve for a particular protein at 0.1 molar NaCl whereas this is at 0.01 molar NaCl. So with increasing concentration, with the increasing concentration what is happening is Tm is shifting to higher value. It tells you that the introduction of salt which is NaCl in this case is increasing stability of that protein. So, not only we can know the thermal stability of a particular protein at a given pH or given solvent condition by looking at the absorbance as a function of temperature, we can also tell about the aggregation or effect of a particular solvent on the aggregation kinetics. So aggregation kinetics can also be measured using absorbance as 600 nanometer. As I discussed earlier here what we are looking at the aggregation phenomena or a scattering phenomena which is due to formation of aggregate, it is not the absorbance. So we generally measure absorbance as 600 nanometer, it is just to avoid 
looking at the absorbance which generally happens around 280 nanometer uh, because of tryptophan. So, we are trying ourselves to be in a region which is quite far from the uh, absorbance or quite far from the 280 nanometer where our tryptophan absorbs. So, when we look at uh, absorbance as 600 nanometer, we are looking at the increase in absorbance due to a scattering and that is basically because of increase in the aggregates, increase in the aggregate. So, by looking at the absorbance at 600 nanometer versus time, what we are looking at is the aggregation kinetics and in aggregation three things basically we look at first is your lag time, the second is your rate of aggregation, aggregation and third thing is your third thing is your extent of aggregation, extent of aggregation, aggregation and all three things can be Mm, qualitatively obtained from the measurement of aggregation kinetics using UV visible spectrophotometer. So, what we are looking at absorbance as 600 nanometer. So, basically the distance here where the absorbance increase in absorbance is very minimal is known as lag time, lag time whereas, if you look at this slope that will give you idea about extent of aggregation and here this plateau can give you the idea about extent of aggregation. And if you look from this place uh, what you can see is that from 1 to 7, 1 to 7 you see there is first increase in lag time if you go from 7 to 1 or you go from 1 to 7, let us go from 1 to 7, what we are seeing is first decrease in lag time, the second is steepness of slope increases, steepness of slope increases and the third thing is extent of aggregation which is given by this plateau increases. So, extent of aggregation increases aggregation increases. And if you look at the first is in presence of trehalose, so this is in presence of trehalose where say 7 is in presence of no additives, this is no additives. Okay. So, if you go from 7 to 1 then what we will see increase in lag time, steepness of slope decreases, extent of aggregation decreases. So, the first which corresponds to trehalose, trehalose is able to increase the lag time and able to decrease the rate of aggregation and able to also decrease extent of aggregation. So, if you are looking at uh, inhibitor for aggregation, trehalose will be the best for the aggregation of this is basically for BSA C tab system. So, if you are looking for inhibitor of BSA C tab system and trehalose is going to be the best, trehalose is going to be the best inhibitor. UV visible spectroscopy can also be used to study enzyme kinetics. For studying enzyme kinetics, you need to have a good chromophore which absorbs in a range where protein and substrate does not. So, this is the representative kinetic trace of product formation and parameters such as activity of enzyme can be obtained from this trace and we can also look at the different effect of different conditions on uh, rate of product formation. For example, pH effect on rate of product formation of solvent effect. So, these are the kind of things we can do 
here I am not uh, telling you in detail, but uh, one lecture I am going to devote where I am going to look at how to get different thermodynamic and kinetic parameters using a spectroscopic signal. So, now look at uh, this uh, the protonation deprotonation effect resulting from change in pH. Uh, this oxidation reduction affect your electron distribution in chromophore and here you see this is your pH 6, this is at pH 6, this is at pH 13 and both have different kind of a spectra. So, at pH 13 you have this spectra, at pH 6 you have this spectra. So, I have already told this can be used to get the pK value, get the pK value. Now, I will tell you one effect of ligand on a protein. So, effect of ligand on protein can also be studied. You can see how the structure of a particular protein changes when you add a particular additive or ligand. Uh, cytochrome C has a heme group and it has well known solid band which is uh, between 350 nanometer to 490 nanometer and that is due to pi to pi star transition and the change in the lambda max can happen due to spin state to oxidized state of heme group. So, here I am showing you effect of SDS which is so sodium dodecyl sulphate a surfactant on cytochrome C. So, we can look at absorbance is 4 10 nanometer with SDS concentration and this is in pre CMC region of SDS and you can see that our absorbance is increasing with increase in SDS concentration. But in post CMC region the effect is quite different and what you can see is with the increase in SDS concentration there is a decrease in your decrease in the absorbance. So, you can tell that within one region there is a different kind of conformational change and in the post CMC region there is a different kind of your structural change and then you can use different kind of a spectroscopy to get more idea about uh, what kind of a structural changes happening in the protein. I will discuss one in one of my lecture uh, in detail how we can use different kind of a spectroscopy combination of a spectroscopy to know about what kind of a structure a protein gets or interaction with ligand. Uh, here uh, I am showing you peroxidase activity of cytochrome C. Again this kind of activity can be looked at by looking at absorbance. What we do is we add H2O2 and glycol and what we get is tetra glycol which has absorbance as 470 nanometer. So, if cytochrome C is active or a cytochrome C has peroxidase activity then it can convert this compound to this one which absorbs at 470 nanometer. Now, you can see that cytochrome C is here cytochrome C gives you this kind of curve. So, absorbance at 470 nanometer is smaller compared to when I put 1 millimolar SDS and 10 millimolar SDS. So, just by looking at this kind of curve you can tell what is happening to peroxidase activity of cytochrome C when SDS is added. So, this kind of a study can also be done uh, through UV visible spectroscopy. We can also study the titration ok titration and we know we can know the protein ligand ratio using UV visible spectro spectroscopy spectroscopy ok titration this is a titration in which titrant and solution causes the formation of metal complex accompanied by a by an observable change in light absorbance by titrated solution 
they are similar to conventional visual titration only thing is here we are following the course uh, with the add of UV visible detector rather than naked eye. So, we can have uh, different kind of color for analyte reagent and product and based on that we will get different kind of your titration curves. For example, if you have a colorless analyte, reagent is colorless and product is colored, in that case we will get this kind of this kind of um, this kind of titration profile. If analyte is colorless, reagent is colored and product is colorless, then we will get this kind of titration profile. Sorry, this kind of titration profile. Okay. Uh, when analyte is colored, uh, reagent is colorless and product is colorless, in that case certainly there will be decrease in the, so you will get this kind of uh, titration profile. Uh, this is colored, colored and this is colorless, then you can get the, this kind of profile. So, different kind of titration profile will be obtained depending on the type of analyte reagent and product or color of analyte reagent and product, uh, but you can get the end point, you can get the end point from all these titration profiles. So, here is the end point, here is the end point, here is the end point and here is the end point. And that can tell you about the stoichiometric ratio of analyte and a reagent analyte and reagent which results into a, project, a product. We can also study charge transfer spectra. So, these are the charge transfer donor, these are the charge transfer acceptor and we can look at the complexes. For example, lambda max of benzene is 255 nanometer uh, while iodine in hexane is 500 nanometer. A charge transfer complex displays an intense additional band at 290 nanometer, 290 nanometer. So, this benzene is at 255 nanometer, this absorbs at 500 nanometer, but this, um, this complex, this complex absorbs at uh, your 280 nanometer and similarly in aniline aniline and tetracyanoethylene. Tetracyanoethylene complex lambda max of aniline and tetracyanoethylene is 280 and 5, 300 nanometer, whereas complex has lambda max around 600 nanometer. Here you, you see anthracene pictate. So, this is donor, this is acceptor and they have uh, you know lambda max and we can study the charge transfer spectra by looking at absorbance at different uh, nanometer. So, this is all about UV visible spectroscopy, UV visible spectroscopy. There are hundred of applications of UV visible spectroscopy, few of them I have uh, showed you and a uh, lot more I will be showing in the uh, next set of lectures, next set of lectures, uh, but uh, the idea is same. Either you can do qualitative analysis or quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis using your UV visible spectroscopy for qualitative analysis, lambda max is important for quantitative analysis absorbance at lambda max is uh, important. What does that mean is epsilon at lambda max is uh, important and uh, we are Lambert's law can be used to get the quantity using UV visible spectroscopy. The next thing is uh, fluorescence spectroscopy and uh, this is based on emission spectrum, emission spectra or emission phenomena. So, when a molecule absorbs light and electron is promoted to higher excited state, the excited state can get depopulated in several different way and that is what is shown here. So, this is your ground state, it goes to S1 on absorption of energy 
and then there can be different things happening. Some can be non-radiative and some can be radiative. Non-radiative means no light is getting produced, only energy will be lost as a heat, whereas in radiative process energy is lost as a light, lost as a light. So, first thing quenching can happen in the excited state and quenching is your non-radiative process. Energy transfer can take place which is non-radiative, whereas two different kind of radiative process can happen. It will directly grow to ground state. In that case, uh, that is known as fluorescence, whereas if it does undergo intersystem crossing, to a triplet state and then emission takes place, that process is known as phosphorescence. So, there are two radiative processes, one is fluorescence and another is phosphorescence. Fluorescence happens from singlet excited state to singlet ground state, whereas phosphorescence happens from T1 to S0, T1 to S0. So, this is T1 to S0 by emitting light then this process is called phosphorescence. And uh, in the fluorescence what happens is first uh, molecule dissipates its energy by undergoing conformational changes and relax to lowest vibrational level of excited state in the process called vibrational relaxation and that is basically non-radiative process and after that is uh, from this place. So, this is suppose this is the lowest vibrational uh, level of the excited state. So, first it comes to lowest uh, vibrational levels of excited state and then radiative process happens and the radiative process is called fluorescence. This is another way to represent same phenomena. This diagram is basically called Jablonski diagram. Here we have already told the emission from T1 is called phosphorescence. So, what is happening that uh, if the molecule absorbs light, it goes from S0 state to S2, S2 and then internal conversion takes place such that it comes back to lowest vibrational state and then the fluorescence will happen from the lowest vibrational state. So, the excited molecules come back to ground state by emitting light and that process is called fluorescence. So, coming from the upper vibrational level to lowest vibrational level of the excited state is known as internal conversion, whereas going from singlet state to triplet state is known as intersystem crossing and coming from triplet state to ground state is known as your phosphorescence. Now, there are some important facts uh, about the fluorescence. First is known as a Stokes shift. What does it tells you? That energy of emission is typically less than that of absorption. And so, fluorescence typically occurs at lower energy or longer wavelength compared to absorbance. And this is quite clear because if you remember these are the excited state vibrational levels, this is ground state vibrational levels. So, what happens that first your molecule goes from the ground state to some of the vibrational levels, some of the vibrational levels depending on how much energy you have supplied. Uh, so, but what happens that after that it comes back to the lowest level of the lowest vibrational level of the excited state and uh, from there the fluorescence takes place. And so, energy of absorption is always higher than energy of emission, energy of emission and so, so energy of absorption is always higher than energy of emission and so, lambda max for absorbance is always lower than lambda for emission and so lambda emission is always higher. So, that is what it is written that fluorescence typically occurs at lower energies 
or longer wavelength. Same thing we are trying to show through electronic picture. Uh, the emitted light is always of lower energy or longer wavelength and the process, this process is basically known as a stock shift and same thing is shown here, energy versus interatomic distance, this is your potential energy diagram, these are the two electronic states, this is S0 and S1, these are the different vibrational level of S0, this is, these are the different vibrational level of S1. So, on absorption of light, the excited molecule goes from your vibrational, lowest vibrational level to sum of the vibrational level of S1 and then what happens that there is your non-radiative transition from higher vibrational level of S1 to low, lowest vibrational level of S1 and that is your non-radiative, but from the lowest vibrational level to ground state, it is the radiative transition, the radiative transition and that process is called as fluorescence, that process is known as fluorescence. Okay, um, there is an important parameter what is known as quantum weld and that is given by number of photons emitted by number of photon absorbed. So, if there is no loss here, then number of photons and number of uh, emitted and number of photons absorbed will be equal, but there are losses at this place and so quantum yield is going to be less than 1. In a given solvent, quantum yield of particular fluorophore will be fixed because of this, every fluorophore will have a characteristic fluorescence spectrum. The second characteristic of fluorescence spectra is known as CASA rule. This tells you that same fluorescence emission spectrum is generally observed irrespective of excitation wavelength. This happens since internal conversion is rapid. So, internal conversion is rapid. So, same fluorescence emission spectrum is generally going to be obtained. So, basically what does this mean is if this is your excited state, this is ground state, then if there is absorption, this process is very fast compared to this process. And so, a fluorescence emission spectrum is generally same irrespective of excitation wavelength, irrespective of excitation wavelength because this process whether it goes to at this vibrational level, it has to come back to this level, it has to come to ground level and this process is rapid. So, this process internal conversion is not going to affect the fluorescence emission spectrum. Whether excitation wavelength is smaller or larger, emission spectrum is going to be same. Some other important facts about fluorescence, upon return to the ground state, the fluorophore can return to any of the ground state vibrational levels. The spacing of vibrational levels of the excited state is similar to that of ground state and consequence of above two is emission spectrum is typically a mirror image of absorption spectrum of the S0 to S1 transition. So, this is very important, these two facts are very important and that leads to this observation. So, fluorophore can return to any of the ground state vibrational levels. So, suppose these are here, so if from this state it can go come to here, it can come to this place, it can come to this vibrational level, it can come to this vibrational level. So, the fluorophore can return to any of the ground state vibrational level and then spacing between these two levels are same. Okay? So, this gap between these two energy levels in S1 or S0 is going to be same. And so, what happens is emission spectrum is going to be mirror image of absorption spectrum. We will explain again in the next slide. So, look at this is the fluorescence excitation spectrum, what is happening? 
So, if a fluorophore absorbs light, then it can go to any of the vibrational level. And you see here, since the electronic transition is quite rapid compared to the movement in nucleus, and so this transition can be shown as a vertical line. And uh, if you show it as a vertical line, you can see that you know it is reaching here, it is reaching at this place, it is reaching at this place, and so intensity will be like this. So, this is going to be highest because you see this is reaching at this place, and uh, this is going to be lower than this one, this is going to be medium depending on kind of wave function uh, where it is ending up. So, this is your the spectra electronic spectra of anthracene, electronic spectra of fluorescence excitation spectrum of anthracene. Now, look at the emission. Emission will take place from this place to this place, again it has to come to this and since the spacing is quite similar, again coming from this to this place, this will have highest intensity, whereas this one will have medium and this one is a lower. So, if you look at it is going to be mirror image quite, uh, so anthracene emission spectrum is going to be mirror image of excitation spectrum and I will show you it here. So, this is your emission spectrum and this is excitation spectrum, this is the wave number. So, wave number for emission is going to be lower and wave number of excitation is going to be higher. But if you look at this, you see if you put here a mirror, then this excitation spectrum is the mirror image of emission spectrum, this is for anthracene. And this is because of two important facts that from the lowest energy level of the excited state, the chromophore can come to any of the vibrational level of the ground state and second thing is the gap between the vibrational level in S0 state is same uh, as the gap between the vibrational levels of S1 state. There are two other important uh, parameters, one is called fluorescence sense lifetime, another is called quantum yield. Quantum yield I have already discussed, but let us again talk about quantum yield. Quantum yield is the ratio of the number of photons emitted to the number absorbed and this Q will be given by your the emission rate of fluorophore divided by emission rate of fluorophore plus rate of non-radiative decay, non-radiative decay. So, you can think of that uh, when uh, fluorophore absorbs certain number of uh, photons during absorption process, some of these photons are lost due to non-radiative process and some of the photons are lost due to your radiative process. So, the sum of this emissive rate of fluorophore and the rate of non-radiative decay will be proportional to number of photon absorbed, whereas this is the emissive rate of fluorophore and that will be the proportional to number of photons emitted. So, Q is basically the ratio between the rate of emission divided by total rate of emission. Total rate uh, basically consists of rate of emission and rate of non-radiative decay. Then there is a lifetime, lifetime of excited state is defined by the average time the molecule spends in excited state prior to the return to the ground state, prior to the return to the ground state and so this is lifetime will be inversely proportional to your the rate of emissive decay or emissive rate of fluorophore plus rate of non-radiative decay. So, this will, so inverse of this rate of decay is known as lifetime.
and this is the basically average time the molecule spends in excited state prior to the return to the ground state, prior to the return to the ground state. There are few more important uh, terms which you need to know in the fluorescence. One is your natural lifetime. So, natural lifetime is the lifetime of fluorophore in absence of your non-radiative process, in absence of sorry non-radiative process and that is given by tau n is 1 by tau, tau n is 1 by tau which is rate of this lifetime is 1 by cap tau and that is basically your rate of emission, rate of emission. So, this is your rate of you can say radiative emission. Fluorescence lifetimes are near 10 nanosecond, this is well known fact and I will tell you what is the importance of that. Scintillators have large tau value and so they have large Q and lifetime. The fluorescence emission of aromatic substances containing nitro groups are generally weak due to large K and R value. Quantum yield is generally determined by compare with the standard and these are the standards given and their quantum yield at a particular condition. For example, benzene uh, at 20 degree Celsius in cyclohexane solvent has 50.05 if you obtain a spectrum in 270 to 300 nanometer. So, depending on uh, the chromophore you are using, you can use different kind of standard compounds whose quantum yield is known and based on their quantum yield and the fluorescence intensity obtained for a particular fluorophore, you can obtain the quantum yield. Now, let us understand what is the importance of the lifetime, what is the importance of lifetime. The absorption is an instantaneous event, what does it mean is lifetime of absorption process is very small, it is in femtosecond to picosecond time scale. It occurs so fast that there is no time for molecular motion during the absorption process and thus absorption spectra are not sensitive to molecular dynamics and cannot provide information on the effect of the different effect of processes, effect of certain change in condition on the processes which are happening in time scale greater than uh, femtosecond or picosecond. So, absorption spectra are not sensitive to molecular dynamics and can provide information on every solvent cell adjacent to the chromophore. So, it can only provide average property. In contrast to absorption, emission occurs over a longer period of time and if you remember lifetime I told you is around 10 nanosecond. So, what does that mean is that the length of time fluorescent molecule remains in excited state is around, uh, around 10 nanosecond and so this provides an opportunity for interaction with other molecule in solution like oxygen. And so, Fluorescence can be used to study fluorophore solvent interaction, but UV visible spectra cannot be used since the time scale in which fluorescent solvent interaction takes place is uh, in nanosecond, is in nanosecond, whereas absorption is uh, absorption lifetime happens, absorption lifetime happens in uh, femtosecond and uh, picosecond region. So, you cannot use absorption to study the, flu uh, the fluorophore solvent interaction, the fluorophore solvent interaction. Uh, so, uh, then we need to uh, talk about quenching phenomena, but since now time is up, so I am going to stop here. 
in the next class I will discuss about quenching and fret which are the two very important processes in fluorescence and which is quite often used to um, study different kind of system. So thank you very much for listening. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Thank you.